Good morning. So thank you for joining us for the Contemporary Military Forum titled Land Power and Integrated Deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. I'm Lieutenant General retired Michael Williamson, Vice President and General Manager, Missiles and Fire Control, Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin is one of AUSA's star sponsor and very proud to be a part of this professional development forum. As you know, Lockheed continues to be a, a prime player in our national defense, and we're excited to be a partner with the Association of the United States Army. We appreciate what the Association does for the Army, the total Army, through educating, informing, and connecting, as we see right here at AUSA this week. Thank you for being a part of this program. It should be a very exciting discussion. Now I'll turn this over to uh, Lieutenant General Retired Sean McFarland. Okay, we're gonna find out how many retired three stars it takes to introduce a panel now. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us today for the Contemporary Military Forum on Land Power and Integrated Deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. And as your professional association, the Association of the United States Armies, uh, proud to provide forums like this throughout the year that broaden the knowledge base on Army professionals and those who support the Army. AUSA will amplify the Army's narrative to audiences inside the Army and help uh, to further the Association's mission to be the voice of the Army and support for the soldier. Of course, we can't do this alone. AUSA relies on its members to help tell the Army's story and to support our soldiers and their families. A strong membership base is vitally important for our advocacy efforts in Congress, the Pentagon, and the defense industrial base, and to the public and communities across the, countries, the country through our 121 chapters within the U.S. and eight other countries. If you're an AUSA member, thanks. For those of you who aren't, Army professionals who are not yet members, uh, we encourage you to join AUSA by visiting the membership booth, uh, booth 307 in Exhibit Hall A, or sign up online at AUSA.org slash membership. So uh, for our speakers today, we have this uh, deck of cards, Tony, there's yours. Um, Thank you, sir. Commemorating our uh, Medal of Honor recipients. And on behalf of General Brown, our president, and the rest of AUSA's team, um, thanks for your time. We really appreciate it, you being here with us today. So now I'll turn it over to yet another retired Lieutenant General, Tony Crutchfield, Vice President of Army Systems at Boeing, uh, to uh, moderate the panel. Gentlemen, over to you. Well, thanks, Sean, and thanks, Mike. It's always great to see both of you, my battle buddies. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Tony Crutchfield, your panel moderator, and I'm quite excited. I appreciate General Flynn and AUSA asking me to do this. Uh, I've, of course, stayed connected to the Indo-PACOM region. My last assignment was as the Deputy Commander of U.S. PACOM, and so I'm looking forward to this conversation today and also seeing uh, some great, uh, I think I could say friends to a congressman. Okay, I hope so. I, if not, I'm edit that out if I can. <laughs> it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our panel members today. Uh, to my left and your right, first will be uh, General uh, Charles Flynn, Charlie Flynn, uh, the CG of USERPAC. Next to him is U.S. Representative Robert Whitman from the 1st District of Virginia. Uh, joining us in just a few minutes will be Dr. Mara Carlin, who's the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans, and Capabilities. She'll be joining us uh, here shortly. She got delayed. Uh, also, Lieutenant General uh, Toshi, Toshikazu Yakamani, uh, Yamani, who is the Vice Chief of Staff of the Japan Ground Self-Defense Forces. And then, um, last but not least, first in our hearts, the newest, Division Commander in the United States Army. Up in Alaska, we have Major General Brian Eifler, the CG of the 11th Airborne Brigade. Thank you all uh, for joining us here today. Uh, we'd like to start off with the panel's comments, and I'll turn it over to General Flynn. 
Thanks, thanks, Tony. Um, Congressman, thanks for being here. General Yamani, thanks for being here. Um, and just thanks to AUSA for, uh, for helping us out and giving us this platform. Uh, a couple of comments up front that I make, so just to discount a few things that the region is often referred to as the Air and Maritime Theater. It is not. It is a joint theater. It requires joint solutions because it's got joint challenges. And the Army plays a central and critical role uh, as the leader of the land power network across Asia. I'll also remind people while the theater is named after two oceans, there's two continents out there, the Asian continent and the continent of Australia. And it's connected by an archipelago land bridge through Southeast Asia. I uh, would also geographically, because I think it's important, you know, if you look back at the Second World War, there were actually three theaters out there. And so you actually, when you're talking about the region, you really do need to talk about it in the sub-regions. And so I'll, I'll uh, make a few uh, points here on, you know, sort of the geometry of the geography in the region because it matters. Hi, ma'am, good morning. Um, so from uh, the western tip of Indonesia to the eastern tip is going from London to Tehran. The entire European continent can fit essentially in the South China Sea with a little overlap in Vietnam and the Philippines. It is a massive part of the world. Um, again, back to uh, it's a joint theater with joint challenges and requires joint solutions. There's really three things I think that uh, uh, the adversary has in this region that is um, concerning for us. One is they're operating off of interior lines. The second thing is they have mass. And then the third thing is they have a magazine depth that's difficult to match. And then of course, the uh, and, and Japan sits right at the knife's edge of this, right? The, uh, there's a Russian threat there, there's a North Korean threat, and then there's a Chinese threat. So these, these complicate the challenges across the region. Uh, I would also express to you that you know, what we are trying to do is uh, do a couple of things. And I'll say this, uh, uh, there's three sort of objectives that we stay focused on in US Army Pacific. One is we're trying to increase our joint readiness in the region. The second thing we're trying to do is we're trying to increase the confidence in the interoperability, the human, technical, and procedural interoperability, because there's three types of interoperability with our allies and partners. And then the three, third thing we're trying to do is deny key terrain. Key terrain being both physical terrain because of the uh, criticality, the choke points there, and then the human terrain that exists out there, which is, uh, I know it's 25% of the land mass, but six out of 10 people in the world live there, and we're on a path to about seven out of 10 and 40% of the global GDP exists in Asia. So the strategic weight of this century rests in Asia, and that's why it is the priority theater in the national defense strategy and for the national security of the United States. And I'm sure Dr. Carlin will mention some things about that. Um, in the national defense strategy, it talks about integrated deterrence, it talks about campaigning, and it talks about uh, war fighting advantages. And so I'll talk about uh, three things that we're doing in US Army Pacific, and then I'll give some context to things that we're doing by way of war fighting, campaigning, and war gaming. But there's three major uh, initiatives that we're undertaking in the region. The first is uh, what I would refer to as sort of a, a, a picket line or creating interior lines uh, uh, in the first island chain, around into Southeast Asia, and up onto the Asian continent. And that, that is uh, a, a network that is working with the allies and partners. Security Force Assistance Brigade is part of that. The Multi-Domain Task Force is part of that. Ground-based manned and unmanned sensors is part of that. Activating our Army preposition stocks that are in Japan and in Korea, and then activating the uh, vessels that we have afloat with APS in the region. It's also activating what I refer to as material activity sets, separate from Army preposition stocks, in the various locations where we exercise. So the first thing is 
through Picket Line Pacific, which is our ability to see, sense, and understand what's actually happening with the adversaries in the region. The second thing that we're trying to do and have done is we've created a combat training center in Hawaii and Alaska and in the region called JPMRC, Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center. It is the Army's contribution to PIMTEC, which is the Pacific uh, multi-domain training and experimentation capability. Those campuses exist in Hawaii over the eight islands and the archipelago uh, tropic jungle environment that we have in Hawaii, surrounded by joint forces. It also exists in the Yukon training area and the Donnelly training area in Alaska, uh, in the north where we have extreme cold weather, mountain, uh, and extreme uh, altitudes that those forces have to operate, and Brian can mention that. And then also we have an exportable version of, of JPMRC that we brought into Indonesia in the last two years for Garuda Shield. And this is basically a live, virtual, and constructive environment, much like our training center in Europe and the two that we have in the continental the United States. Put that in Indonesia the last two years, and in 23, we're going to put it in Australia, in Rockhampton and Shoalwater Bay, uh, Townsville area, where the Australians are building their combat training center. And then the third thing that we're doing, and this is our contribution to our operational design and the way the Army campaigns in the Pacific is Operation Pathways. Not merely just a series of exercises, it is literally our equation uh, or our contribution to integrated deterrence. And I, uh, I express the SECDEF's uh, definition of integrated deterrence as, deterrence as the sum of these four parts, capability, posture, messaging, and will. So Pathways is the push of our capabilities forward into the region. Posture is our ability to operate with the allies and partners in the region to create access points for us to operate from so that we can uh, be forward in the region and do the three things that I mentioned, increase joint readiness, increase confidence, and interoperability with our allies and partners, deny key terrain. And then the third thing, and the third thing that we're doing as part of Pathways is by, by being forward over time, we believe that that presence uh, forward with our allies and partners actually ties together the land power network that's so vital to the region. So 80% of the militaries in the region are Army, they're land forces. Much of the special operations and the Marines come from their Army. Uh, four out of five Chads in the region are Army generals. The, security architecture that binds that region together is land forces. I recognize that it's named after two oceans and it's often referred to as an air and maritime theater, but land forces in that region are central because they protect national sovereignty. They protect national sovereignty and that is what is at risk right now is the violation of that national sovereignty, whether it's in the air, at sea, or on the ground. And much of that is happening on the continent of Asia, throughout the uh, archipelago in Southeast Asia, out into Oceania. Um, and so our role uh, working with that land power network is to make sure that uh, there is no gaps or seams between the relationships that we have with our allies and partners. Uh, last uh, three points I'd make is on uh, uh, war fighting, campaigning, um, and, um, and war gaming. So first thing on war fighting. So JPMRC is our contribution to war fighting at, out there at the tactical level and below. That's the training center in Hawaii and Alaska and in the region. The second thing is, and we just finished a core war fighter with uh, First Corps, uh, had Marines, PAC Fleet, PAC AF, but maybe the more important point was my headquarters played the high con to that First Corps and to the two subordinate divisions multi-domain task forces and the enabling commands. That hasn't happened on our Army in the past, okay? So headquarters need to get in the game of training in the Army, and I know that uh, General Pappas and some others at Force Com are helping with that. So there's a couple of examples of war fighting, training in different ways where Army forces support the Joint Force. The second thing, campaigning. So much of what I described with those three things, the uh, interior lines, the training center in the Pacific, pathways, again, that's our contribution to campaigning, and that is our contribution to integrated deterrence for the Joint Force Commander and 
uh, the Secretary of Defense. And then the third thing is war gaming. Um, the, uh, this past year, we did Unified Pacific War Game Series. It's essentially the Army's contribution uh, to the, the, uh, the challenges that we have in the Indo-Pacific. It's much akin to what the, global, uh, what the global series is for the Navy. And so this campaign of learning that we can do between global and unified Pacific is really important. Maybe what's more important is that from that war game, uh, and we've published a uh, unclassed version of the seven insights, Two of them I want to point out because two of them are, are games that we're going to war or aspects that we're going to war game this year. The first is indications and warning and collection uh, in the region, and that will be done in January. And then in March, we're going to have a war game on joint contested logistics. Much of what Secretary Warmoth mentioned yesterday about the Army's contribution to logistics and our ability to create conditions for operational endurance. So. Again, a lot going on in the Pacific, a lot of great um, initiatives that are underway. Much has been accomplished in the last 15, 16 months, but boy, we got a lot of work to do and we need all of your help to do that. So again, thanks for your time and I look forward to your questions and I appreciate everyone on the panel again being here today, thanks. switch with you. Well, good morning. What an honor and a privilege it is to be here at uh, AUSA. And, and let me open by saying this. The Army is a critical element of the joint force in the Indo-PACOM. Let me say that again. The Army is a critical element of the joint force in the Indo-PACOM, period. Pretty simple and straightforward. There are challenges in front of us. Let's, let's make no bones about it. And the things that we have to do to make sure the Army has the capability and capacity in that theater are significant. Uh, just as General Flynn pointed out, having those pathways, those lines of operability there uh, where the tyranny of distance creates a big challenge for us. Logistics. Logistics is key in this theater. The Army has lots of great uh, operational capabilities in a lot of different ways. The key is, is how do you link all of those, those capabilities together? And I'll go to General Omar Bradley, who said this. He said, tactics are for amateurs. Logistics are for professionals. In this theater, logistics will be the key. And here are the things that we need to do. And Congress needs to be at the, at the, at the forefront of this. The Army needs the ability to operate in that theater. And the element of that that's key is sea lift and airlift. We have to be able to get the Army to the fight. We have to sustain the Army in the fight. The key today as we speak is the Ready Reserve Fleet is at 41 ships. They average 46 years old. The last time there was a turbo activation, only about 60% of those ships were ready to go to sea. In the Maritime Security Program, those are ships that are on call for the United States military. There are 60 ships today. Put that in perspective about the number of ships that were there when we mobilized for the Gulf War, 380 ships. Think about that. Think about the magnitude of what we have to do in the Indo-PACOM. Logistics is key, sea lift is key. We need to make sure that we are as quickly as possible rebuilding that capacity and capability with sea lift. And that means taking the roll on, roll off ships that we're purchasing now, getting them into the fleet, making sure that they can move both materials and troops. We want to make sure, too, that we are looking at building purpose-built sea lift ships here in the United States. Let's get that going. I think we can build those when we do multi-ship procurement. I think we can do that at a very reasonable rate, and we can do it at pace. Another element that's key, too, is once you get to theater, the question is, is how do you move things around in theater? Just as General Flynn talked about, pathways are critical, but pathways rely on intra-theater lift. How do you move things around? How do you make sure, too, that things that are critical to your operations, fuel, munitions, stores, how do you make sure that those are dispersed so that our adversary can't go to one place and say, well, if I just take out these two ships, we're good? No. 
we want to make, make sure that we disperse those elements. We want to make sure, too, we disperse our capability and capacity in that region. We want to make sure when, we're, uh, when we have that long-range precision strike, let's make sure it's dispersed. When we have that, that long-range capability, that long-range reach, it has to be dispersed. How do we make sure we disperse it, we move it around? We, we want to increase the risk calculus for the Chinese. We want to make sure they look at it and go, wow, man, we, we, we can't go to one place and strike. In fact, we're going to have to expend a lot of munitions in order to take out a portion of the capability. We want to make sure they go Winchester before we go Winchester. That's the key. And how do we do that? Do we disperse our assets there? We make sure, too, we have lift to do that. And lift includes intra-theater lift. Those are keys. You know, a lot of folks talk about the Navy and the Indo-PACOM. Which force has more ships than the Navy? The Army, exactly. And we need to make sure that we continue along those lines. Intra-theater lift is going to be key. Let's look, too, as we, as we vision or envision the scenario that the Army is going to face there. It is going to be a critical element of the joint force. And it's going to make sure, too, that as things begin to unfold, that the Army is there as, as part of that force that uh, pushes forward that sustains and holds ground. You know, it's, it's fine that the tip of the spear is the Marine Corps of the Navy, but it's the Army that's going to sustain and hold. Another element that's key, too, is anything that happens in a, in a, in a Chinese effort against Taiwan is going to have to involve a land force. You can do all you can in the air and coming across the Taiwanese Straits, but if China, if China is going to in any way, shape, or form try to take Taiwan, it has to go to Taipei. So guess what? The Army is going to play a critical role there. And I believe the Army will play the critical role in every day from now forward, as it has in the days previous. Look at what's happened in Ukraine. Look at what happened in 2014 when the Russians came in in their, in their uh, we'll, we'll call it clandestine forces there, to go ahead and essentially take over Ukraine, install their own government. The Ukrainian people said, no, sorry, we're not going to have that. But what happened after 2014? It was the United States that trained Ukrainian forces. And what's the critical element of why Ukrainian forces are successful today? It's because the Ukrainian army adopted the structure that we know is the secret sauce for the United States military. They put in place non-commissioned officer corps and a commissioned officer corps. That was the key, and watch how they're operating today. The operational capability that they have is based upon that. We ought to take that lesson learned and do everything we can in training Taiwanese forces. Now, we know Taiwan doesn't have necessarily a standing army. They have a National Guard. But we can do the same thing with Taiwan as we did with the Ukrainians, make sure we train their forces. The army will be the critical element in making sure those forces are trained and have the capability moving forward to make sure they can resist any sort of effort by the Chinese. That is another element of deterrence. Remember, folks, it's, it's about twofold. It's about, as General Flynn said, the war gaming and making sure we understand all the scenarios. It's about being able to defeat the Chinese if called upon, but it's making sure we build capacity and capability quickly so we can deter the Chinese. Let's make the risk calculus for them such that they go, you know, maybe we thought about it, but maybe we shouldn't do that because we know the cost that we're going to incur if we make that move. The way we do that is to make sure, too, that we have Taiwanese forces that are trained and are capable. The United States Army showed that it can do that in what happened in Ukraine, and we can do that again with Taiwan. Those things, I think, are going to be, be critically important in, in that theater. I want to make sure, too, that we understand how do we make sure that we are devoting the right resources in Army modernization efforts. You know, the multi-domain task forces are incredibly capable. They're a flexible, adaptable force that can move, and, and talking about movement, maneuver in that space is going to be critical. So maneuver in that area is different than, than maneuvering as a land force. Maneuvering there is going to require that intra-theater lift. That means Congress is going to have to make sure that we properly resource the Army in what it does in modernization. And I want to make sure, too, that the Army Futures Command, I think, my personal opinion, the Army Futures Command needs to be moved back up to a place of prominence. I believe Army Futures Command is going to be the key for the way things move forward. It has to operate directly under the Secretary of the Army. I believe that those things are critical in the pathway forward. 
we have to emphasize the modernization of the Army and the things that it needs to do to operate in the Indo-PACOM. All of those things, I think, are critical. So if you talk about logistics, if you talk about those pathways and having the capability and capacity to operate in those lines of, of, of operability there within theater, to make sure, too, that we have the ability to disperse all of our critical logistics, to make sure there's not one place where the Chinese can go, to make sure the Army can move about, to make sure the Army can sustain. Uh, if the flag goes up, we want to make sure the Army can sustain in that theater. We want to make sure, too, that it's a critical element in making sure there's capacity in Taiwan as a land force, as we've seen what, ha what has happened in the there in Ukraine. The lessons that we've learned here recently show us the pathway forward for the Army. Army Futures Command needs to be in a place of prominence in the Army because those decisions and the things going forward are going to be key. The operational capability of multi-domain task forces is going to also be key. Folks, I believe that the Army is indeed going to be that critical element of the joint force in that theater. A lot of times it's hard for folks to see that because there's a lot of water out there. But we know sustainment and the ability to not only gain ground but to hold ground. And just as General Flynn said, I agree with him, there's an awful lot of land out there in addition to the water. How do we make sure we do that? And how do we make sure that the deterrent element of what the Army brings to the table and the ability to operate in that theater is key? And folks, we can do that. You know, I, I love military history. All you have to do is to look at what the Army did during World War II, and you can see the Army has incredible capability in that theater. Let's make sure that we have the will, the wherewithal, and the direction so the Army has the capability and capacity to have what it needs to operate in that theater. Congress has to play a critical part of that, and I appreciate what the Army's doing to make sure they're charting the path forward and being very aggressive and forward-looking about what the Army will do to be that critical element of the joint force in the Indo-PACOM. Thank you, sir. Dr. Carlin, uh, it's uh, great to have you here. Uh, we met years ago when uh, I was on active duty. It's good to see you again. I don't know if you remember me, but uh, Indeed, it's, it's good to great see you. to see you. And please uh, uh, go ahead with your comments. Thank you, uh, and thank you so much. Uh, it's a treat to be here. I apologize for showing up late. I feel like I should make a logistics joke, which would resonate uh, with, with this crowd. Uh, but look, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak at AUSA this morning and with such a fantastic group of panelists. Um, and, uh, and I know y'all are gonna throw a lot of hard questions uh, at us as well, so I'll, I'll speak a little bit quickly. I thought what I might do is spend a few minutes talking about integrated deterrence. You know, this is really kind of a key concept in the national defense strategy. And then a little bit about kind of what we're seeing uh, the Army doing with it in the Indo-Pacific. Although you heard uh, General Flynn's fantastic exposition uh, and have seen no doubt his real leadership on this. Uh, so look, in integrated deterrence, you all have heard this term a lot and you'll no doubt also know that the national defense strategy is really premised on this urgent need to sustain and strengthen deterrence with the focus on the People's Republic of China. And we have heard about deterrence, frankly, since all of us were young, no doubt. And so what I wanna do is help you all understand why this concept's a little bit different, why we felt this need to kind of mature, mature this concept uh, and really pull together this new approach that brings to bear all of our resources. And by all of our, I really mean all of our, right? Across the Department of Defense, across the US government, and really with our, our allies and partners. So I find it best to understand the concept of integrated deterrence, frankly, by breaking it up into its two words. So let's do integrated and then let's do deterrence. So integrated, who, what, where, what are we talking about, right? What you want to do is you want to think about three cohorts that are being integrated. The Department of Defense, the interagency, and our allies and partners. And there are responsibilities incumbent on all of those when we're thinking integrated. So inside the Department of Defense, this is the one, no doubt, we're all probably most interested in. Right, for us to integrate inside the Department of Defense, it means we've got to have a combat credible force. It means we have to be able to look across theaters, across the spectrum of conflict, to really, and, and excuse me, and across domains so that we can deal with challenges. Let's talk about what that looks like, right? Across domains. Obviously, we're sitting here, we're talking a whole lot about land power, but that doesn't mean that we are not thinking about all of the other relevant domains because frankly, our adversaries are as well. We know what today's character of warfare looks like. We know how it's changing. We have got to look across domains. 
across theaters. We know this as well, right? We see the uh, perturbing behavior of the People's Republic of China in the Indo-Pacific, and that is a real concern. We also see it in other regions as well. We cannot just only focus on the region we might find most interesting. We have to look across regions. And we have to look across the spectrum of conflict. I really appreciated um, the citation of the 2014 uh, invasion of Crimea because it was such a good lesson, I think, for all of us about how adversaries can move across that spectrum of conflict, right? Where we saw what was kind of this gray zone effort, right? It wasn't exactly sure what was happening. And it took us uh, all a while, I think, to really diagnose and then to be able to kind of move forward. So. We have to be comfortable moving across that spectrum of conflict. What's happening kind of in the gray zone and hybrid warfare? What's happening in, in the conventional setting? How do we understand how our adversaries or challengers are looking across the spectrum of conflict? And how do we get comfortable doing that as well? So integrated inside the Department of Defense, that means we are looking across domains, we are looking across theaters, and we are looking across the spectrum of conflict so we can have a combat credible force. That's kind of what's most, you know, most incumbent on all of us. Then we've got across our interagency. We know that we are most successful as a US government when we're all focused on our comparative advantages, right? When our diplomats are focused on delivering in their world, when our treasury colleagues are focused on just sanctioning the heck out of our adversaries, right? When all of us are showing up across the interagency doing what we do best. And when we try to do one another's roles, there's opportunity costs and we're not nearly as good at it as well. So that's that second cohort of the interagency. And then there's that third cohort, our unparalleled network of allies and partners. And wow, is that extraordinary. There is not a, another country in the world and there sure is not another country like Russia or the People's Republic of China that has anything anywhere close to it, right? Allies and partners in regions across the world that want to collaborate, that want to work together, that often have a very similar vision of what right looks like. You heard General Flynn speaking just a little bit about the extraordinary work that he and his team are doing with our allies and partners across the Indo-Pacific. And we just see this in spades. It brings a comparative advantage as we deal with challenges. So that's the integrated piece, right? Those three cohorts inside the Department of Defense, across the interagency, and with our allies and partners. Now deterrence. Now again, we've all, we've all known what deterrence is, and even in the post 9-11 wars, where frankly the concept of deterrence perhaps wasn't as relevant given the sorts of challengers we face like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, nevertheless, we've all had the idea of deterrence in the, back, in the back of our mind. And what we're trying to do with the idea of integrated deterrence is evolve that a bit and mature that a bit and be a little bit more rigorous about it. So we're used to kind of traditional logics of deterrence, right? Deterrence by denial of benefits. You can't achieve what you are trying to achieve, right? Or deterrence by cost and position. Wow, it is going to be so painful when you try to do that thing. We're trying to mature the notion, for example, by deterrence by resilience, right? Making it so that even if you see a challenger, an adversary try to do something, the impact bounces off. And then you get to think about escalation on your own terms because you're resilient, because you can withstand that for first blow. For all of this to work, for these ideas of deterrence to work, we've really got to have good feedback loops, right? We've got to have a good understanding. How does the adversary perceive what's going on? And are we having the impact we think we are having, right? That's a hard conversation to have because there's often resources and attention put toward an issue, but we really have to be rigorous, right? We have to be comfortable looking and saying, we have tried to do X or Y, did it work? And then really being able to learn. So this idea of integrated deterrence, it's really trying to help us learn to have these feedback loops so we can figure out across the department, across the interagency, across our allies and partners, are we actually deterring effectively in the ways that we think we are? And if not, where do we need to make some adjustments? So you all know that the Army is doing just some fantastic work in this space. And I would for a moment though shoot it out a little bit beyond the Army and look at just the joint force writ large. You all saw the President's budget come out, largest budget request in Department of Defense history. And I hope when you read it, you really saw just the serious focus on building a combat credible force, right? A combat credible force that is focused on dealing with strategic competitors.
Now, when you look at some of the great things that the Army's doing in the Indo-Pacific specifically, right, the multi-domain task force, for example, I would really focus on the size of what the Army is doing, and I would also focus on the shape of what, these are, what the Army is doing. And I say that because I think both of those are pretty interesting. So the size, you've heard General Flynn speak a little bit. There's some great, great case studies here, in particular the exercise that the, um, that the, that the Army has traditionally done with the Indonesians, um, Garuda Shield. So this was a bilateral exercise the Army did with the Indonesians, and that was great. But Actually, what the Army's been able to do lately is change the size of it dramatically, right? So now you have 14 countries participating, not two. You have 4,000 troops participating, right? Not just folks from, again, the United States or Indonesia. That's a great case study of how we are working with that unparalleled network of allies and partners and really changing the size of what we're doing, right? But I also noticed that it's the size that's interesting it's also the scale that's really, excuse me, the scope that's really interesting or the shape, right? What we are seeing with the Army in the Indo-Pacific is new efforts, new approaches, new operational concepts, a lot of creativity, frankly, a lot of innovation, and that has been important. I think looking at some of the work um, with Patriots in the Philippines has been just a fantastic case study there. So I note all of this because for integrated deterrence to work, what you were hearing is that we have all got to work together. We've all got to work together in a pretty focused and tailored, right, and deliberate manner in really ensuring that we are able to deal with these challenges um, that are ahead. And I think when I look at the work that the Army is doing in particular, in the Indo-Pacific, we've got some really, really big shoes to fill, and that's fantastic. Thank you all very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Ohayou gozaimasu. I'm a Lieutenant General Yamane, Vice Chief of Staff, Japan Ground Service Defense Force, JGSDF. And uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, excellent panel. Uh, as uh, my uh, opening remarks, I would like to explain the strategic environment surrounding Japan and introduce JGSDF's efforts. So, slide, okay. Next slide, please. Uh, in the vicinity of Japan, PLC, North Korea, and Russia, Russia are strengthening their military power and intensifying their military activities, which can be regarded as a critical point for security and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. North Korea has conducted ballistic missile launches repeatedly this year and been unilaterally escalating its provocations against the international community. Russia is now invading Ukraine this is a clear challenge to the existing international order. PLC continues unilateral attempts to change the status quo by coercion in the East and South China Seas. On the right bottom slide, as science and technology, technology advance, warfare shifts to include new capabilities across several domains, including outer space, cyberspace, and electromagnetic space. On the next slide, uh, let's take a look at the environment surrounding Japan from a different angle. Next slide. This picture is rotated approximately 90 degrees and Japan is highlighted by the yellow outline. The Japanese archipelago can be seen as a lead of the Eurasian continent. The dotted lines show the activities of the, of the naval and air force of PRC and Russia. The PRC Navy and Air Force have expanded and intensified their activities in the ocean and airspace surrounding Japan, including the areas around the Senkaku Islands, which PRC selfishly claim. In addition, PRC and Russia have made progress in military cooperation in recent years. 
and have also intensified bilateral exercises near Japan. In other words, the expansion pressure from the Eurasian puts serious pressure on Japan, as our country is located as a lead geographically. Japan's position puts increased pressure on our country, and this pressure has been particularly high in the southwestern islands of Japan in recent years. In addition, various conflicts of national interest exist in this area. Therefore, it is very important to be stable of this area. This area has a significant impact on the sta uh, stability of the entire Indo-Pacific region. Next slide, please. In order to respond to these status uh, situations, let me explain Japan's endeavor. First of all, the goals of Japan's defense are to create a desirable security environment, deter threats, and respond to them in the event of crisis. Japan will achieve these goals through its own national defense architecture, the U.S.-Japan alliance, and security cooperation. Based on this concept, the JSDF has also been strengthening its defense posture. Next slide, uh, next slide please. This slide shows JGSDF's activities from peacetime to the so-called gray zone. In peacetime, the JGSDF continues ISR and information gathering activities and deters the occurrence of incidents by preventing escalation through exercises and sending out strategic messages, thereby contributing to area stability. In this regard, the JGSDF is trying to strengthen its operation capabilities in new domains such as cyber, electromagnetic, and cognitive domains in order to offset the asymmetric enemy military capabilities. In order to avoid a lack of forces in the southwestern area, the JGSDF is establishing camps in remote islands. We are shifting our focus on military affairs from east to west. Next slide. Furthermore, in the event of an escalation, the JGSDF focuses on establishing a response posture ahead of the enemy's actions. By doing that, the JGSDF imposes a higher cost for the, for the changing the status quo to make the enemy abandon its aggression. For this reason, the JGSDF is strengthening capabilities in new domains and enhancing maneuver and deployment capabilities to deploy units in the southwestern region. If unfortunate military aggression against Japan occurs, each response is conducted jointly. The JGSDF executes each operation such as joint anti-ship, anti-ground attack, and integrated air and missile defense in accordance with cross-domain operation concept while contributing to intelligence activities. Next slide. In order to strengthen the, uh, deterrence and response capabilities of the U.S.-Japan alliance, JGSDF is trying to improve cooperation between the land forces. Here, I will explain about training as an example. First of all, the JGSDF has been collaborating its cross-domain operation CDO with MDO of the US, U.S. Army in Yamasakura and Orient Shield exercises, while also collaborating our CDO with EABO of the U.S. Marine Corps in Resolute Dragon exercise, exercise, etc. Another effort we are pursuing is the expansion of existing bilateral exercises to multilateral ones. 
it is quite significant to make U.S.-Japan exercise multilateral, as I will explain on the next slide. Next slide, please. Japan is eager to maintain peace and stability and considers it most desirable for the international community to prevent wars. To this end, the JGSDF continues its efforts to build a desirable security environment. As part of these initiatives, we are conducting senior level exchanges, strategic dialogue, bilateral and multilateral exercises, capacity building cooperation, and international disaster relief activities. According to these activities, we should strengthen cooperation with other, with other countries in the region such as the Quad, European countries, ASEAN countries, and Pacific Island countries. Through these initiatives, we intend to mitigate and eliminate the stabilizing factors in the Indo-Pacific region and to build a common foundation to deal with regional issue cooperatively. For this purpose, the JGSDF will strive to stabilize the region through multilateral cooperation by maintaining and strengthening networks with other countries, ground forces based on the relationship we share with U.S. forces. In this context, we believe that the multilateralization of exercises will truly be the uh, cornerstone for building and strengthening land power networks. And I strongly believe these activities will serve as a foundation for a free and open Indo-Pacific. Next slide, please. Last but not least, Japanese government has decided to fundamentally strengthen its defense capability within five years based on the basic policy, as we call big bond policy, under the leadership of Prime Minister Kishida. This could be the largest decision making since Japan started to take steps as a peace loving nation after the Second World War. In other words, Japan is currently feeling serious threat. It can be said that the strategic environment surrounding Japan is extremely severe. Under these circumstances, Japan will achieve the stability of the Indo-Pacific region and defense of Japan by means of three efforts such as strengthening its own national defense architecture, the U.S.-Japan alliance, and security cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. I just was mesmerized by that great picture of a mountain with snow on it. So I uh, appreciate that. I'm General Brian Eifler. I'm the commander of the, the newest division in the Army, the 11th Airborne Division. Uh, it's a very unique division. I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, the creation of it, a lot of people ask why we did that. But it is a convergence, a unity of mission, purpose, and identity that was just was lacking uh, up in Alaska in the forces. And uh, we've always had some capability up there, but now it's unified, it's focused and it's growing in its capability. Uh, with the, the unique organization of an airborne division up there, it's not, a, again, a unique division. It's not completely airborne, half airborne, half light air assault, which provides capabilities in the region uh, that we are developing and continuing with our allies and partners. Uh, but also, uh, that unique mission also extends, not necessarily just in Indo-PACOM, but obviously we have to support the Indo-PACOM theater, and, uh, and we are integrated in that. But also, one of our additional missions, as given by the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary, is to be the Arctic and Mountain Force for the Army, the experts in that. And so, uh, because we do that, we also uh, uh, work a lot with our Arctic allies, and not just uh, Arctic allies in uh, Scandinavia and across and with Canada, but also in the region we have extreme cold weather mountain uh, uh, countries that we work with, uh, like Japan and, uh, and uh, Mongolia, Nepal, India, 
and Korea, and we continue to foster those relationships. So having that unique organization and then also in a unique location. Uh, anybody by a show of hands have been to Alaska? All right, keep them up if you've been in 30 below or, or colder weather. Okay, it's a, it's a life-changing experience. And to use that and to train in that uh, on a regular basis to operate in it, let alone fight in it, it takes a different type of soldier and it takes unique equipment. Uh, and that's what we're developing up there uh, in, in Alaska. And so we do a lot more training in the winter. We flip the training cycle. Uh, most forces do a, uh, in the Army do a lot of heavy training from the spring through the fall. We've reversed that. And uh, right now we're starting our heavy, intense training. We've had our first snow up there. Uh, and uh, that's what we do through the winter, high intensity and get back that Arctic ethos that we used to have up there decades ago in Alaska. So we're focusing not on just not just on our our metal and our key task uh, in the region, but we also have to be those experts in extreme cold weather and mountain terrain. And, is not, and that is not easy. And uh, as we know, that's not for everybody. So again, uh, I want to make sure we have time for all the questions that we're going to, but I just wanted to say uh, thanks and down from heaven comes 11. <laughs> uh, well, thank you all for the opening comments. It certainly gives us something to think about. Uh, I'd like to transition now to your questions. We have a microphone. I see one microphone up here, and I see our public affairs staff is also here to help us. Uh, can we get a microphone over on this side also, please? Uh, and uh, is there another microphone? Can uh, you come up? Can we get yeah? Can we get a microphone up there so we're you know so you're... you can use mine? Yeah. Okay. So I invite you all to. Uh, begin to ask questions either by coming up to the microphone or having the sergeant here uh, give you um, a microphone to ask your question. Please. Here's one in the front. Uh, thanks to all the panelists for outstanding presentations. It's such a critically important topic. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Carlin. Um, does the DOD, the interagency, and the partner network have the infrastructure and tools to coordinate actions and measure effects, the feedback loop you talked about, to achieve integrated deterrence? I really appreciate that question um, because it, it shows that it's one thing for us to have these really good ideas. It's a whole nother thing to operationalize it, um, especially uh, this point on do we have the organization infrastructure on the feedback loops, right? It's how do we, how do we make integrated deterrence real? Uh, and it seems to me to do that, you have to have an idea of everything you're doing vis-a-vis -a, -vis a topic, right? All of the relevant folks involved. And then once you have an idea of what that looks like, you work closely, whether with kind of experts in the intelligence community or other smart folks on a topic to try to figure out, okay, did we have this effect or not have that effect? And you've got to do it in a cumulative way as well because you're probably not going to see it on one discrete issue but you'll have to take it in and then you have to work it back into your system right there's a there's this, this great study that was done on Pearl Harbor about signals and noise uh, by Roberta Wolstetter and Wolstetter focused on this idea of you know there's all this noise how do you figure out what are the signals that you're sending and how do you adjust in terms of those uh, so we're working on it is my answer we're, we're working hard and uh, and to be to be frank um, the the Ukraine war has actually actually been a helpful effort for us to test these things out. Because as you all know, starting um, kind of late last year, um, as we were starting to see um, in indications of what the Russians were going to do across the department, across the interagency, and with our allies and partners, we started to figure out, OK, what's this going to look like? How do we understand it? What will we be doing? Um, and that actually put in place um, kind of some structures that have been tremendously helpful. Now, on one level, when you're in a crisis, uh, there's kind of an urgency there to think of new structures and test them out and stress test and see what works or doesn't work. Uh, and so we are, we are making this progress. I think what will be important is as we continue to uh, refine it, no doubt, but also to ensure that it gets kind of baked into our daily battle rhythm. It's not just the crisis issues, although those will be urgent and acute and crucial, but also those, those longer term challenges as well. Thank you for asking that. Can, can I, uh, I'm, oh, I'm, I actually, um, so I think we uh, need to help the department out as well. I'll give you an example. 
because um, Dr. Carlin mentioned it. So Garuda Shield, to me, that is a measurement we need to give back to the department say, look, it was two countries, now it's 14. And then, you know, I'm down in Australia and, you know, the uh, ROC Chief of Army, Australian Chief of Army, Japanese Chief of Army, General Yoshida. Now we're talking about, uh, he had an engagement with the Phil Chief, the Philippine Chief, General Bronner, and now the Philippine Army wants to participate in Orient Shield and Yamasakura. So to me, these are indicators of measurements where the DOD, the interagency, uh, and the allies and partners, the three parts of the integrated piece that Dr. Carlin talked about it, and then the four parts of integrated deterrence that I talked about, capability, posture, messaging, and will. That's where these things kind of come together. And I think we're in the early stages of it, but I think that the feedback loop that she mentioned, the military contribution to that is what are we actually seeing with the allies and partners in the region and their level of participation in various exercises. Honestly, what was going on uh, in Indonesia happened at the same time that all this foolishness was going on around Taiwan. And to a country and to a leader, they were sort of like, hey, you know, we're down here with 14 countries training together, rehearsing together, creating opportunities for unity and collective commitment. And this is what the Chinese are doing. I mean, I think that it became very real to them that there's a difference between the way they're behaving and the way we're behaving. And I think that's the kind of feedback that we owe the department. Hi, gentlemen. John Klein, Johnson Controls. I really appreciate your y'all's presentation, and I really like the visualization, General, that you described as the picket line on the first island chain. And it clearly shows that infrastructure is really important to the mission that all, all of y'all have to do. What kind of technology do you need from your infrastructure to make better decisions as a warfighter? Thank you all. Well, I, I'll, uh, I know Laura Potter's sitting here right in the first row. So, I mean, we need some uh, deep sensing capabilities, and uh, we're, we're starting to work on that with an aircraft Ares over there that's flying out of Kadena. Um, there are ground sensors that we need uh, to put in locations um, because I, I, I think that <clears throat> the aerial layer and the space layer, uh, by way of balancing a portfolio. I think we've got a lot, I won't say a lot, but I think we have the, the portfolio is heavy in air and heavy in space. Not to say that we don't need those, but we need a terrestrial manned and unmanned sensor network out there just as much as we need additional air and space assets. So getting things on the ground that are all weather that don't necessarily need, you know, uh, a bunch of people to maintain them. Some of these some of these sensors we can just basically put there uh, and go check on it every once in a while. Some other ones we'll need to put people around. But for the most part, uh, we need some terrestrial uh, sensors. We need, uh, I, I, you can't get Titan out there fast enough for us. <laughs> and, um, and if I you know, had an empty checkbook, I'd buy five Ares air aircraft. To, because of the deep sensing requirements of the joint force. And then I would also express that, so this is a big difference between the multi-domain task force and what the multi-domain task force does. It will provide fusion of sensing of all targets in support of the joint force. And it's going to pull together um, uh, those uh, targets for the joint force. And so having other technologies that can help us on the ground to balance out what's happening in the air and what's happening at space, then I think that we're in a much better place. Second part of this is that when we do this with allies and partners, there is an information sharing uh, element to this that is beneficial for not just the United States, but it's actually beneficial for these other countries as well. And so that is another aspect where industry can help us uh, and I know they're there. We just need to get our hands on them and get them out there. Sure. 
Thank you. Um, I'm Sangbin Lee. I'm a reporter from uh, Radio Free Asia. I have a question about North Korea to General Fulin and Dr. Colin. As you mentioned, the North Korea continue to launch ballistic missile, and then they claim that they have a tactical nuclear weapon unit to use. So given this threat from North Korea, uh, can you tell me what your specific measure to deter a North Korea threat? In related to that, do you consider deploying additional thought in Korean, South Korea to deter North Korea threat? All right, thank you very much. Uh, look, this is obviously a serious concern that, that you're raising, and I wouldn't, of course, here try to talk through any um, kind of dilemmas or policies or debates that we're having. I would just say that uh, North Korea's actions have uh, and continue, excuse me, continue to remain a serious concern um, for us, and moreover, I would say for a whole lot of our allies and partners, both around the Indo-Pacific and, and around the world, and it's, uh, it's an issue that we monitor very, very closely. My feelings are mutual. I think General Yamani expressed it quite well uh, that in the last couple of months, they've had some numerous irresponsible and uh, uh, dangerous behaviors. So we keep an eye on it. And uh, I'm actually encouraged with the training that we are doing uh, in Korea because actually the scale of that, the, the, uh, the, the scope of that, the complexity of that is uh, much better today and on a, and on a very um, a positive path uh, because we, we need that with uh, our ROC counterparts, 8th Army commander sitting there just to the end of the aisle that you're in. Sir, if you want to ask him a few questions at the end, that's fine too. You can give him more details. Put him on the spot instead of put a microphone in front of him. So, all right. Other questions? Let's go this side of the room and go to this Iron Major over here. <coughs> Thank you. Mark McCarley, uh, this question is directed to Lieutenant General Yunani. Uh, sir, is there an expectation that uh, Prime Minister Kushida and the Diet will make modifications to the Constitution to allow extraterritorial deployment of your forces in defense of the Indo-Pacific region? <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Very good question. <laughs> but as you know, I'm a military officer, so <laughs> I cannot say anything. But uh, um, now uh, Japan is on the way to change uh, so many things. So uh, that means the, uh, I think uh, if we don't change anything, we cannot uh, protect our country. So many uh, politicians and also so many um, uh, workers for the uh, nations uh, is trying to change the constitution. But I'm not sure. We can do it or not. Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'm, I'll, uh, I'm going to give an observation on what General Yamani just said. Because I was out there in 2014 and I left in 18. And, what, and this is about change. The things that I have seen the Japanese Ground Self Defense Force change in the way we are training is really remarkable in just a short, very short period of time. Just one example, their future operating concept, cross-domain operations, is very much like ours with multi-domain operations. So there's a lot of synergy that gets created when the forces come together to do the training. And the conversation is a, is a lot deeper, it's a lot richer, um, and, and, and the interoperability the three forms of it, right, the human, technical, and procedural parts of it, um, it just advances much faster uh, given uh, the, the, the seriousness by which the Japanese uh, military leaders are, are actually uh, conducting training and uh, experiments and exercising with us. Good morning. Major Russell. Three Corps G5, 
So the U.S. Marine Corps recently released their plan to reshape their formations to meet the challenges of the Indo-Pacific AOR. Their divest to invest uh, strategy resulted in the loss of tube artillery, tanks, and other enablers to support a force structure that supports stand-in forces in their EABO concepts. So what is the Army or how has the Army uh, taken advantage of interoperability and other power projection between the first and the second island chains? How do we plan on training that at the operational and the tactical level, vice, core, and above? Yeah, okay, so um, first, I, I would, what I would say is that um, I'm very encouraged by, so the third Marine Littoral Regiment just stood up a few months ago in Hawaii. The third MLR is going to uh, participate along with the first MDTF and the third MDTF that we just built in uh, Hawaii or building in the JPMRC rotation in Hawaii. So to your question, it really starts with us training together so we can complement one another's capabilities on, on, uh, on their future operating concept and then the organizations and, and the way that we are progressing with our future operating concept. Now, more specifically forward, so there is, um, there is a lot of um, uh, coordination that happens between the Marine Corps and the Army of the Pacific and special operations and our allies and partners. When I talk about the land power network, it's really those four parts. It's not just the Army. Army, Marine Corps, Special Operations, Allies and Partners. So all of the logistics, I shouldn't say all, but a good deal of the logistics that we end up um, sharing and co-using during our exercises, much of that happens between the land forces. Uh, watercraft, we move the Marines quite a bit with our watercraft and just in, in Australia, in uh, Coolandong, they had watercraft out there, LSVs and LSUs, moving those forces around um, on the northern part of, uh, of Australia. So, I mean, there, there is a number of opportunities in the Pacific because of Operation Pathways and the exercises that go on between both the, the with really the land power network where where we're learning from one another on their future operating concept, ours, and then the capabilities that that each one of those uh, new formations are bringing to the region. If I could just add one point, because I really appreciate the first part of your uh, your question, which was highlighting what the Marines are doing, um, and the the changes that the Marines have been making over the last few years. I think it was 2019 or so when General Berger first started pitching this idea of Force Design 2030, um, and you all have seen a whole lot of conversation about it. Um, it's a pretty big deal to say the strategy is taking me in a different direction, so I need to actually make meaningful change in line with that. So I just wanted to offer huge kudos, huge kudos to the Marine leadership, uh, to the Marine Corps leadership for being willing to do that. I appreciate General Flynn's spot on point about just how much learning uh, there is that's, go that's going in on that. Uh, but you've seen some really important leadership there, uh, and that's not an easy thing to do. If I can add one thing to that, I, I appreciate too Force Design 2030 and the transition that the Marine Corps is making. One of the elements though about the divest to invest strategy that I think is, is problematic is that you are making an assumption by divest to invest is that our adversaries are going to wait around as we develop new technology and we modernize. And let me tell you, they're not going to do that. So what we have to make sure as we are making that transition and modernization, I think it's wrong to call it divest to invest. It's redirecting our investments. It's making sure we're on the path to modernize because what we have to do is to be able to take existing platforms that have some capability left and making some changes to them to make sure we extend their lifespan as we are putting in place new systems, as we modernize. We cannot go through a bathtub. We can't say, oh, we're going to divest in all these assets and then we're going to you know, wait around five, ten years. And remember, all of our dreams come true outside the fit up, right? So I, I, I want to make sure that we are doing things inside the fit up, make sure the palm reflects that and make sure too that we're having a, a, a thoughtful transition 
that sends a clear message to our adversaries that we're not going to wait around. We may have some older systems, but guess what? We're, we're, pretty, we're pretty creative and, and pretty imaginative. We're going to make those new systems even more capable as we bring on board even more capable new systems in making sure that we're using technologies that are, out, that are out there. We can develop things in real time. We can use digital twin technology to test things, figure out do they work, don't they work, let's make uh, uh, adjustments overnight. Let's make those platforms more effective. We can do that as we transition to, to new technology. AI is another place where we have tremendous capability. Those are things we have to bring forward on a daily basis and we have to operate at the speed of reality and we also have to be willing to take risks reasonable risk not not ridiculous risk but we have to be able to take risk because here's the situation our adversaries china start with a blank sheet of paper and they go you know what we just we can we can we can thought uh, manage our direction where we need to go here in the united states when you start down that path what do you end up with a whole page full of no you can't do this no you can't do that no you can't do this this is not a requirement there uh we, we have to make sure this becomes a program of record we have to get more adaptable. We have to be able to break down the, the impediments in the bureaucracy to make sure we get technology much more quickly to the warfighter and we modernize at the pace of reality. Let's go to the front of the room and then we'll, we'll, we'll go over here to the uh, right side. Hi, uh, Caitlin Kenny with Defense One. Um, my question is on um, training of Taiwan, Taiwanese forces, um, similar to Ukraine. Um, how likely is that? Um, can you, what do you envision that training would be? Would it be in country, in the US, just in exercises or all three? Um, what kind of training tactics, weapons? And then are there any concerns on an escalation with China like we saw with Speaker Pelosi's visit if we do something like that? Thanks. Um. So a uh, couple things. One, um, last week we had the Liu Wei talks for the 20th year. So my point in saying that is that for 20 years, the Taiwan Army and the U.S. Army have been having an annual week of talks to determine what are the operations, activities, investments that we're going to um, uh, focus on for five years? So we do it every year and we look out five years. Last year, um, General Xu, the chief of the Taiwan Army, came. Uh, this year, he sent his vice chief, but last year I invited him to come visit JPMRC, and he's coming to Hawaii in about three weeks uh, to see um, I think it's 2nd Brigade of the 25th go through their rotation in Hawaii. I, I bring that to the front of the, the answer of the question because uh, in those talks, they actually ask us uh, what are the, what's the help that they need from us. Um, and it's, it's, it's a range of things from mobile training teams, but it's also uh, assistance with planning, operational planning, um, tactical planning, but then also, you know, tactical um, training to increase the proficiency of their tactical formations. It's done in a wide range of ways. So, for example, Exercise Northern Strike in Michigan with the Michigan National Guard, that's a big exercise where they come back to the states. Um, and so these are, uh, and then the Security Force Assistance Brigade that is at the, the talks, but then they, they, we work on ways for them uh, to provide assistance with tactical proficiency. Um, and so I, I'm, I, I, you know, from the talks last year to the talks this year, and to the second part of your question about, I think what, you know, what recently happened there uh, in and around Taiwan, um, there, there's a, a renewed, uh, sense of urgency and focus about regaining and focusing on proficiency uh, in planning and uh, in training. And so we'll continue to, uh, to work with them through these talks and, and put things uh, down on paper so that we can find ways to work together to help them. Over here. 
Hello, uh, Colonel Mark Sturgeon. I'm a, a student at the U.S. Army War College. Um, given the integral role that the Army plays in uh, deterring Russian aggression in the European theater, to assuring our allies, uh, enabling assistance to Ukraine, and, and meeting our, our NATO obligations, uh, does the Army have sufficient capacity as currently structured to meet its integrated deterrence requirements in the Indo-PACOM? Uh, and, and if not, what are the areas where we need to grow? How do we need to restructure? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so a couple things. One, and you may or may not be aware of this, so we are growing. Um, the first MDTF was stood up a couple of years. That's uh, assigned. The third MDTF is standing up now. Um, there's a theater f fires element uh, in, in, in my headquarters at the theater army. Uh, there are parts of the enabling commands that are growing. Uh, there's a composite watercraft company, an active duty composite watercraft company that's going into uh, Japan in the 24-25 uh, time frame with the MSV light, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the modernized watercraft that we're getting. So there are structural adjustments that are going on uh, in the theater army uh, that uh, address the, uh, the heart of your question. Is there adequate capacity? I would tell you, given the things that we are creating and the, the, the assets that we have available right now, I would say yes, we have what we need to do what we need to do in the region. That's actually not where, uh, um, where I'm concerned. It's more about creating the conditions forward in the region with the allies and partners than I am with the actual capacity uh, of the Army, uh, of the theater army in the Pacific. I, I'm more concerned about the 25th Infantry Division, 8th Army, 11th uh, Airborne, the theater enabling commands, making sure that we have a, a, uh, a routine and cyclic way to generate forces in the region and then deploy them and employ them in the region with the allies and partners. I'll tell you one thing that's really valuable right now. We used to pack up our tactical formations in Alaska and Hawaii and send them back to Louisiana through the Panama Canal. So that force was essentially not available because it was disaggregated between ships and then it had to get off in a port in Texas and get on rail and, and go up to uh, the training center in Louisiana. Or when I was the 25th commander, we sent the aviation to the West Coast and they self-deployed from California to Louisiana. So they're not in the region. Now they're in the region and they need to stay in the region and they need to train in the region. So the sum of the parts is that we actually have more structure by being forward in the region. And if you want to call the, you know, the line between Hawaii and Alaska the third island chain, then, then, then from my perspective, we're in a good place. And we're, in, and we're in a good place now. We need to stay in that place and then keep pressing forward with all the organizational adjustments that I was just uh, discussing. Uh, and I'll, I'll go a step further because I saw General Helwig over here. There are some sustainment capabilities that we're going to need in the, in the theater army so that we can create conditions for operational endurance of the joint force, of the joint force. Um, we need more composite watercraft companies. So there's, that's why we're war gaming. So as an Army War College student, you, you would appreciate that. That's why we're war gaming, to find out where those gaps are so that we can then go back to the Department of the Army, the Department of Defense, and say, hey, here are our gaps. These are the capabilities that we can either kill or fill to fill that gap, or make a choice to not do that because there's other things that we have to do. But, um, uh, but, but the region and, uh, and the Army requires some additional uh, capabilities, but I think it's within reach given uh, what we're doing by way of planning. Thanks. Any questions? Because I, I want to make sure I'm helping the sergeant get her steps across this room. So uh, we're coming back this way. Anything for the middle?
here, sir. Where are you? Right here? Got it. Thank you. So I'm really getting your steps now, Sergeant. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Woody from Business Insider. Uh, two questions, uh, if I may. General Imane, your presentation focused on the Southwest approaches. Given uh, tensions with Russia, does the ground self-defense force have to refocus or reemphasize Japan's northern approaches? And then for the other panelists, uh, regarding Army logistics, uh, in the logistics enterprise, where can the service branches collaborate and coordinate, and where are the service branches needs unique in areas where they'll have to focus on supporting themselves. Um, about the last year, uh, as you know, uh, more than uh, 20 years ago, uh, Japanese uh, defense posture it was concentrated on the north. So uh, every uh, um, facility or uh, very big money was used uh, for the uh, uh, defense of the Hokkaido, is the northern part of Japan, against the Soviet Union. So now Japan is trying to shift some uh, posture, troops, to the uh, uh, from north to the uh, west or uh, south, but uh, the basic uh, basic capability remains in that Hokkaido, and also uh, Hokkaido has a very big, uh, not big training field. Yes, Japan is very small, so uh, and also uh, the, the such kinds of the uh, environment for the training is very good, so. Uh, now we have the uh, two brigade and uh, two division we have in Hokkaido. So I think uh, the, about the only posture uh, is enough uh, to uh, against the uh, uh, Russian uh, pressure, yeah, I think. And, but uh, another point is uh, we need to, we need a transformation you know, about the capability especially for the, uh, um, for example, uh, uh, cyberspace or electromagnetic space. So uh, we need to change some capabilities of uh, troops in Hokkaido. That's all. On, on the uh, logistics question for this different services, I think the way I'd respond is that, so in, in the exercise design um, out in the region, um, so our our funding streams are not they're not designed <laughs> to do that. So what we have to do and we're doing is finding ways to uh, in say operation pathways is um, into the planning is create ways where we can share common user logistics, fuel, band-aids, I mean, you, you name it, those items that each one of the services is going to need by way of, you know, commodities to support an exercise. The other aspect, and I, I touched on this a little bit in my opening, is these activity sets that I'm talking about. So they have sort of a dual use that's very helpful. One is if we lo uh, uh, leave common user logistics on the ground in various locations, say a warehouse or buildings that we uh, lease, then we don't have to drag it back because we brought it in. So there's a, a, a transportation savings. But if we also have the types of equipment on the ground that can be, that kind of material can be used in a humanitarian assistance disaster relief uh, response effort, then that's less we have to drag forward and we have speed to action, speed to need in the event that there is a earthquake, typhoon, tsunami, you name it, because eight out of ten of them in the world happen in that part of the region. This is something we're trying to do in Oceana on the island nations, and it's also something we're trying to do in the region. And actually this last year, I'm very encouraged by some of the, the, the places 
and spaces that we're able to put these uh, things in without a whole lot of faces being there, if you will. So, because I think that that's a really important part of what, what we're trying to do. And the services can come together because the common user logistics that a theater sustainment command in the Army, they can work that with each of the services. We keep it on the ground, we consume it, and then leave behind any of those types of things that are going to be used the following year. So. To add to that, one of the places I think has the most promise for logistics, and it's a place where I think the greatest need is that sea lift. Uh, the problem is, who's going to be the bill payer? You know, every, everybody says, "Hey, listen, the the need we see is there." The bottom line is, the Navy says, "Hey, we don't want to pay for it." And the Army says, "Listen, we we've got lots of different needs. We don't want to have to pay for it." So it's, it's kind of the, the you pay for it, no you pay for it, no you pay for it scenario. And the bottom line is it's in the interest of the entire joint force to make sure we have that logistical laydown. Both large scale lift and sea lift and intra theater lift. I think there is some crossover as General Flynn said in what we can do in intra theater lift as we disperse critical elements of sustainment, fuel, Everybody has the same, same fuel need. How do, you, how do you disperse that in ways where all the different forces are able to use that, know where it's located? The same with other stores that are in common for the, for, for the joint force. I think you have to do that. There also has to be, too, an element of, of commonality in how we talk about logistics in the theater. I know each of the service branches has their own particular needs. But I do believe there needs to be a conversation to, to get around, you know, how do we make sure not only do we get the sea lift, but how do we find lines of commonality in the operational concepts for the Marine Corps in Force Design 2030, for the Army, and for that matter, for the Navy and the Air Force. There are some logistical needs that they have there. Uh, listen, the, 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 the Navy is going to be part of sustaining the, that sea lift element. We have to make sure, too, that we have conversations with private partners that are part of the maritime security program those conversations are going to be critical and again you know we've got a long ways to go in a short time to get there as the old song goes we want to make sure we're getting those things done now because i look at it from this standpoint logistics specifically sea lift in that theater is the most common thread of where we need to be in order to have the necessary deterrence effect there. The Chinese look at us right now and say, you know what, we don't, we don't have to do a whole lot. We don't even have to fire at anything that'll shoot back at us. All we have to do is be able to take out a very, very weak logistics uh, chain. Uh, that's got to change. Yeah, I, I would just add that force structure, of course, does not change on a dime. What does change is experimentation and operational concepts and our ability to weave together new and interesting things in different ways. Uh, and for us to be able to do that, that's going to really get you to kind of this dispersed, this resilient approach, one in which you can show, frankly, the People's Republic of China, as we have historically, that our approach to logistics is simply second to none. Hello, Paul Knapp, uh, Wisconsin Adjutant General and uh, State Partner with Papua New Guinea. Uh, and looking at recent uh, agreements between PRC and the Solomon Islands, uh, what, in terms of the feedback loop and lessons learned, what can we learn from that uh, on how we need to be the partner of choice? It's nice to see a fellow cheese head. Um, the, uh, uh, th thank you for ra raising th this important issue. You know, uh, obviously, have, we, have, we have watched uh, this engagement between the Solomon Islands and the People's Republic of China very closely, uh, and we continue to watch it. We have a history, as I know this crowd is quite familiar with, uh, with the, the Solomon Islands, to, to put, put it lightly, um, and indeed just had a very big interagency delegation led by the Deputy Secretary of State out there to, in particular, commemorate uh, some of that, uh, that, that history. History uh, and some of those sacrifices that were that were made by the U.S. military, and so 
I would say for, for folks who kind of wonder how much, um, you know, how much this matters, I think there's a whole lot of evidence literally sitting there on that island to, to show that um, as the case. Uh, one of the big things that struck me um, is, uh, is just the need for us to make sure we've got an interagency approach here. There is no doubt a Department of Defense element, element here, but really ensuring that looking across the U.S. government, we've got different ways of engaging um, uh, our, our partners like in the Solomon Islands. That's really, I think, uh, going, to be, going to be the most important. Hey, Paul, good to see you. Um, just to sort of highlight a couple things uh, beyond what Dr. Harlan has mentioned. I mean, I do think these small teams, the, uh, the CAT, uh, and the uh, Oceana engagement teams of uh, a diverse set of skills, civil affairs, engineering, um, medical, religious, you name it. I mean, they're, they're very powerful in those small countries. And if we can use Compo 2 and 3, the guard and reserve there, um, uh, because they uh, oftentimes are from within the region. They have the, the cultural sensitivity uh, and the tribal nature of the state of uh, those various island nations there. That is a very, very powerful ingredient to solving some of the problems. And I hear it uh, in volumes back from uh, the point Dr. Carlin made about the interagency aspect of this um, because they they are reflecting back in very strong ways uh, about the power of those small teams coming together to help uh, the people and the military and the police and the government come up with ways to overcome some of the challenges that they have the as you know those uh, island nations out there they really have to recover from a natural disaster, and their concern is being able to get a power grid back up, an airfield, a pier, at a port, a hospital or clinics, and some roads um, so that they can jump back uh, once one of these natural disasters happen out there, and they happen all the time. And so I think this is one of the areas that we in the Army have a very strong suit with Army Corps of Engineers, and other vertical horizontal engineers, nurses, uh, doctors, PAs, um, and civil affairs teams that can come together and bring a, a wide range of skills together, but they work as a team working uh, on behalf of the uh, interagency that is there uh, and try to you know, pull together the DOD efforts, the Department of State efforts, a wide range of other interagency efforts and most importantly, what the nation wants, what the island nation wants. Um, and so we're, we're continuing to do that. We have, I think, five teams in five different island nations right now, and they jump around um, you know, to keep that presence here. I will also say that, like all island nations during COVID, it got very difficult, right? They had to shut down, and they had to close things up for all the right reasons. Now they're opening back up, um, and of course, the adversary is in there too, handing money off, and that becomes a dangerous exchange of what we're doing. But again, I think we're we're on the uh, the side of angels here, doing the right thing in there um, and helping the people and helping the government help their own people. Let me add one thing to that. I think it's critically important to understand the history of where we are today, from what the United States had spoken. It's been almost six years ago now where we said, hey, we're going to rebalance to the Pacific. And as I've had an opportunity to go there and visit with a number of nations, both in ASEAN and the island nations, they give us a big smile when we come and visit. And they go, you know what? You guys are great talkers. But we haven't seen a whole lot of action. And what those uh, ASEAN nations are looking for and the, and, the, and the island nations are looking for is action. Now, listen, I, I think a lot of the things that have gone on at uh, the mill to mill level are good, and I think those things demonstrate a lot of goodwill. But I think we have to be able to get to the next level, and that is the government to government relationship there. Those things hold an awful lot of promise. There is in the, in, in the works, and, and hopefully they're almost to the point of formalization of Pacific partnership with those island nations. We've had some great meetings there. There has been a dedication of funds to, to, to do those things to counter what the PRC is doing in the region. 
if we are going to have impact, it has to not only be the great work that goes on with mill to mill, but it has to be government to government. And they have to see results. You know, it can't just be, oh yeah, we're gonna rebalance specific, we're gonna do all these great things. You know, actions are the most telling element of our seriousness about the rebalance to the Pacific. In the back, right in the back. Hi, Justin Katz with uh, Breaking Defense. My question is for uh, Representative Whitman. Sir, uh, you described earlier the push and pull between the Army and Navy when it comes to sea lift. Uh, the Navy mans the ships, but in a joint fight, the Army is going to have to use the ships. Uh, and that fight has been going on for several years now, probably more than that. I'm wondering, you know, Congress is going to be the one who has to end that fight. How do you realistically see it ending? How do you think Congress is, is eventually going to have to break this impasse? Thank you. Well, listen, I think there are a couple of ways. First of all is we have to be consistent in dedicating resources towards logistic ships. We have to make sure we consistently fund that. We have to look at doing multi-ship procurement. And I think there's a different mechanism we have to use to procure those ships. We've seen that we've given the Navy the permission to buy these used roll-on, roll-off ships. That has been incredibly delayed. Should not have been delayed, but Again, the Navy just says, hey, it's not, not our gig, and you know, we're not in a big rush to go ahead and buy those things. I think being able to use a provision under the Maritime Administration is a great way to go. They, they are in a position to be able to do that, to purchase those ships. We also have to go down the road, too, of uh, building our own purpose-built logistics ships. Not everyone needs to be a row row. Uh, many of them need to be purpose-built. We ought to do that. We ought to do multi-ship procurement. Uh, make a long-term commitment there. We can bring down costs and actually make those ships affordable. But Congress has to not only give the direction, and we have. Remember, we've given uh, authorizing language to purchase those ships, and we've even put, in the, put the money in there. What we have to do is to, I think, look at different mechanisms to execute that. MARAD, I think, is probably the direction to go because we've seen the Navy just isn't interested in executing it. Things have been very, very delayed. And listen, I understand the dynamic. The, 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 the Navy runs the ships, but it's not in, it's not in their direct interest to say we're going to have them uh, available. Uh, the Army has many things it needs to do. I understand its hesitancy to say we don't want to get too far out in front of this because then we end up being the bill payer. I do think, though, it's Congress's role to say this is, this is the resources that we're going to put together and Congress decides how, how those allocations take place amongst the joint force. Remember, this is, a, this is a joint responsibility. There will be elements of sea lift that will affect all the service branches, the Marine Corps, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army. Therefore, we need to look at it in that joint realm. And the bottom line is funding, long-term certainty, and getting these ships built at as fast a pace as possible. I'd like to ask uh, General Eifler a question. Um, on something that uh, that um, General Flynn uh, alluded to earlier, and I know it was an issue uh, while I was in uniform there, something, one of the challenges, and that is the importance of having a regional combat training center in Indo-Asia Pacific. Could you touch on that? Uh, why is that important? And what are some of the things you're doing in your division, maybe in Alaska, to help with that? Yeah, thanks for that, sir. And I know General Flynn hit on it a little bit earlier, but the, uh, it, you know, some people can say that the cost effectiveness of, of sending units from either Hawaii or Alaska uh, is uh, to an NTC or JRTC is in the, in the four, just 40 million about in transportation costs. Uh, and uh, so we can, we can definitely cut that. But, but the bigger reason is really to stay in the region and stay ready and stay relevant. Uh, if you have your equipment outside the region, you can't deploy with it, you can't train with it, you can't fight with it, you're not really maintaining that readiness from that far away. So being able to do it in theater, in the region, uh, and in, a, in an environment that you're likely to have to operate or fight in, uh, that's a game changer. And uh, we've seen that in, uh, in the, for the 25th, and we've definitely seen it for our first round of it in, in Alaska, and we'll do our second one here uh, this winter. Uh, the other thing that it does, and it, you know, the CTC uh, rotations at NTC, JRTC are very uh, high skill of very well resourced and, uh, and uh, equipped. Uh, but, uh, and I think what we need to do is invest equally amount into the, the JPMRC. It's, it's here to stay. 
and we need to do that. And it's, it's helping us with our readiness, and it's helping us specifically uh, for the Arctic Angels to get back into that Arctic ethos that uh, we had a couple decades ago that we're getting back as, the, uh, as a contingency force for the Arctic, but also uh, in the region. So, yes, sir. I'm going to make another uh, comment, and Brian, you can uh, add to this, but, you know, we, um, our material solutions to operate in the Arctic have not been a focus area for the Army in decades because, you know, the conveyor belt back and forth to the Middle East. So, uh, in addition to the skills and proficiency of being able to live and operate first, then you can fight. There are some material solutions that we, with our equipment, that we have to uh, relearn, uh, and we are going to need to do it at a very rapid pace. Everything from batteries to treatment of, of casualties to evacuation of casualties to how weapon systems operate at minus 10, minus 20, minus 30. I mean, it's just flat different. Um, as you can all imagine. So maybe if you want to talk a little bit about that too, because we we have to get back into the PEO and to the ASALT and the industry to help us solve this problem because we're not going to be able to solve it overnight. But we need that kind of equipment. And that is a laboratory that is free of charge for us. I mean, there's nowhere else that we have uh, 14,000, a division worth of troops and attack aviation, medium lift aviation, heavy lift aviation, engineers, you name it. The, the, the payload of capabilities up in Alaska is, uh, is in the Arctic Circle, so it needs to be focused on so we can learn uh, at the scale that we need to learn at with those forces, and you're free to yes, talk. Yes, sir. No, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, we are an airborne division, but we're also an Arctic airborne division. And that uh, that uniqueness of that is very tough for the Army to deal with because it is a, a niche capability, but it's necessary and needed. And so we're helping and uh, trying to help educate the Army and all the industry of what it takes to uh, live and operate, let alone fight in that environment. If you're in an if you're in the airborne and yeah, there's some things you, you have to do distinctively different in airborne operations in the Arctic. Same thing with air assault and ground operations. Touching uh, metal at 30 below is going to change your life. Uh, you can't do things. Uh, anybody have problems changing their windshield wipers? Okay, I admit it. I have changed. Nobody? Just me. Okay, great. A lot of honest people out there. Um, uh, changing them at uh, 30 below is, a, is something that you're not going to do. You're going to put it in a garage or something like that where, you know, a, a lot of the design of what the Army does to function across, you know, motor pools or wherever, if, you know, Sean Barnaby down in, in Fort Hood has got motor pools as far as the eye can see, uh, but there, there's no roofs. There's no, not a lot of garages for all those vehicles. In Alaska, you have to put a vehicle in the garage, a heated garage, for three days before you're going to do maintenance on it. That's a significant life-changing event if you're a mechanic or you're an operator. There's some things that you have to do different to be successful in the Arctic. And that's some of those gaps that we've got to fill uh, with our Army and with our industry to get to that level. It is definitely something that we're working on uh, with the Army, with Combined Arms Center, as well as with industry. But as we say with everybody, you could come to Alaska with all the tourists in the summer and really enjoy it. It's really beautiful. But truly, uh, people that are friends of ours come in the winter. Uh, because that's where you find out what it really is all about. And uh, that's what we're trying to help uh, because, as General Flynn said, to, to live and operate is one thing. To fight there is a whole other uh, issue. So one other thing. His, uh, the Indian uh, Army uh, asked us last year to train at 10,000 feet up in the Himalayas. We had sent them some extreme cold weather gear over the last couple of years, some 15,000 individual sets, and then 15,000, I'll say, so, sort of small unit sets. Um, because operating at that altitude and in those conditions is, as Brian described, you know, radically different. So this is also where, and, and, and they just asked to delay it to December. So it was in October, now it's in December. 
You can imagine the conditions at 10,000 feet um, uh, along the Himalayas, but now we have a force capable of being able to say, yes, we'll be there. Whereas before, that may not have been the response of the United States. And so that's, that is the advantage of training in the environment and in the conditions that you are most likely to operate in. And so that's why I am, I am, uh, I am such a strong zealot and advocate of training in the environment and in the conditions that you're most likely to operate in. That's, that's the criticality to those uh, training campuses in Hawaii and Alaska, and I see Sean here by this time in Europe. We would have never asked forces to come back from Europe to go to Louisiana and California, never. And we can't do that with forces in the Pacific. They must stay in the region. They're more ready, they're more responsive, and candidly, they're more, uh, they're, they're better prepared for the most likely conditions that they're gonna have to operate in with the allies and partners. And we are surrounded by joint assets and the multinational partners, I'm gonna to have to close the door on some of them because we just can't accept as many as we want. But just in Hawaii, there's 11 countries that are coming out to participate. Four with companies and, uh, and seven with observers. And I know the following year, they're all gonna to want to send a company. As I mentioned, the Taiwan Army wants to send a company in 23. So again, this is just a absolutely right thing to do. It's a great, um, it's a great initiative, and I'm very proud of what the 25th Division and 11th uh, Airborne Division have have done to get this together with JPMRC and the Training Support Brigade, the 196 that we have out in uh, in the Pacific. So, if I could just add one point, which is not only uh, does one have better preparation when one is training. Uh, in the environment when it's dealing with challenges, uh, but deterrence looks very, very different because it really shows that you can, no kidding, deal with those challenges. Well, thank you. And thank you all for your questions. Um, I'd like to spend the last couple of minutes that we have first to have General Flynn give us some, um, some final thoughts before I close this out. I, I think I've been talking enough. I'll, I'll just tell you, you know, thanks. Uh, Really, thanks to the panel members. Thank you all for being here today. General Yamani, great to see you again, sir. And Dr. Carlin, thanks. I know you got you know a crazy schedule, but uh, we we need your help. And uh, I would ask you all to uh, continue to assist in our efforts out there in the Pacific, and um, uh, and come visit us. We you know to see what the soldiers are doing, to see what the units are doing, and to understand. Uh, and get a sort of fingertip feel of what's what's happening in the Pacific is really important. I'll, I'll end on this comment. Um, I have been in 10 countries in the last 110 days, and I will tell you while there is some concerning news in the region, I am very optimistic about um, the network of allies and partners that are coming together um, to unify and have a sense of collective commitment uh, against uh, the irresponsible behaviors of not just China, but you know North Korea here in this last year as well. So I, I would just tell you all, while there are challenges, um, I, I am very optimistic about what I'm hearing from the allies and partners in the region about the multinational and multilateral and joint approach that we're taking uh, to counter some of that, uh, that uh, irresponsible behavior. Thanks. Well, General Flynn, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your leadership. Dr. Carlin, General Yamani, General Epler, thank you all so much. What a great honor to be here with such a distinguished group of panelists. I think if there's one takeaway from this panel and what you've heard today is that there are significant challenges out there, but the United States Army, our Department of Defense, the Japanese Army, for that matter, Japan, are up to the challenge. Folks, we are going to be able to meet this challenge, and I think that we will indeed prevail. I think we can deter that uh, aggressive and unacceptable behavior around the world, no matter where it originates, whether it's North Korea, or the PRC or Russia, wherever it may exist, because of the incredible determination and talent of our fighting force and 
the relationships that we have with others around the world. Remember, our relationship with other nations is not transactional. This is about doing what's mutually beneficial for both nations. That's what makes our agreements with other nations different. And I believe that that is the foundation for what we need going forward. I believe that's the foundation for making sure that we indeed have a world that's safe, a world where all of us collectively that have the same mindset about what freedom is all about will indeed deter those nations that have a mindset that is other than that. I think there's great opportunities there. Let's not underestimate the challenge, but folks, if there's anybody on the face of the earth that can meet that challenge and prevail, it is our United States military and the joint force and the relationships that we have with our partners around the world. Do not underestimate us. We will prevail. Thank you for just a terrific conversation. I have learned so much from, from all of you. I think Congressman Whitman just said it perfectly. The only thing I would add is there's this wonderful quote by Winston Churchill where he says, however beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally assess the results. And what I appreciate about the conversation we just heard today is that the results are looking pretty darn good. Thank you. Oh, so thank you very much. Um, uh, in the future, of course, the, uh, uh, we, we, we mean the JJCDF uh, wants to enhance the uh, our relationship with the United States Army and also United States Marine Corps. And also, uh, uh, this is my personal opinion, um, the Japan, Japanese people uh, should know or about the, uh, how severe the uh, circumstances of Japan. And when we discuss about the security of the defense of Japan, uh, so many times that the discussion shifts to the uh, problem of the budget. Yeah, but I don't think so. So we need to know uh, what will happen or, or uh, what is happening now. So uh, in the future, uh, uh, we uh, continue to discuss about the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, security environment. And uh, uh, we will uh, do our best uh, in the future. So thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Uh, honor to be on this panel up here. And uh, the 11th Airborne, the Arctic, uh, division will be in the Himalayas, as General Flynn just said, and uh, that'll be uh, in December, where, where we like it, uh, in the winter. And uh, then we'll also be in northern Japan with the, uh, in Operation North Winds with the, uh, their uh, extreme cold weather element up there in the mountains and the cold weather. And then we'll also, again, to talk about our duplicity about, uh, of our capabilities, our mission set, we'll also do a little bit uh, with, with Finland this winter. So uh, again, if you, you want a challenge, you want to be a part of a special team out there on the net, uh, if you think you got what it takes, come on out and join the 11th Airborne. Who will? Who will? Airborne. Hey, uh, to close us out, uh, I would just like to thank uh, AUSA for bringing this distinguished panel together. And more personally, I'd like to thank my good friend, General Flynn, for letting me be part of it. And Congressman, to see all of you, Mara, it's, it's just wonderful. General, we, we spent some time together also, and it's been an honor for me to be here. Um, and because I've always been a firm believer that you train the standard, not the time, I'm going to give you the five minutes back. How about that? <laughs> Thank you.